Due to the increase in popularity of shows such as Netflix's Bridgerton, the Regency era of England, which took place predominantly from 1811 to 1820, has become a hot topic in pop culture. From the exquisite accent to the style of fashion, it seems as though everything from the Regency era was ripped out of a fairy tale from a wonderland. But could everything about the Regency era really be as exquisite and as picture-perfect as it seems? Or could there be some strange, darker aspects that the TV shows are leaving out? Hey, welcome to Crazy Histories, where we bring you the craziest, weirdest facts from all of human history. Join us today as we look at some of the strange things in the Regency era. Woman didn't wear underwear. Fashion began to change drastically during the Regency era. After the bloodshed of the French Revolution, nobody wanted to risk looking like a French aristocrat of old. These changes allowed women to be more comfortable and made fashionable attire more attainable for lower-class women. The fabrics used in the Regency era were cheaper to obtain and just more accessible. The simpler dresses also meant that maids or attendants were no longer required to help women dress. Interestingly, the simple gowns of the era had a saucy side effect as Regency women went commando and began to wear these dresses without any form of underwear or undergarment. Given the modesty of the era, it's rather amusing to think that the fashionable wealthy women in galas were all dancing around in expensive balls and lavish parties, just streaking it underneath. Rotting pineapples were a fascinating centerpiece. Pineapples are native to South America, which made them somewhat rare treasures in the early 19th century England. Great Britain, even at its height of its empire, never had so much of a foothold in South America, which was dominated by Portugal and Spain. Due to the difficulty of importing them from other countries' colonies, pineapples were so rare and valuable that they were used as treasure displays at the center of tables at banquets instead of being eaten by the guests. Due to the fact that pineapples were not eaten at these banquets and they were just displayed, it meant that over time pineapples began to rot on these tables that the banquets were held on. For the English, it must have been a delight to attend a Regency feast and see just a rare exotic fruit for the first time in their lives. And, and pineapples became more widely available in England and then the rest of the world in the early 20th century when pineapple production was introduced to Hawaii. So eventually that all petered out. Tons of people took opium, and frequently. Opium was refined from the sap of the opium poppy, which was imported in significant quantities to England from its original colony in Bengal. Opiates are very addictive and a very dangerous substance. Popular examples today are heroin and morphine. Opiates were common in household medicines in various forms and were very easy to obtain. The Prince Regent himself was reportedly taking up to 250 drops of opiates a day towards the end of his life. It's hard to imagine now, but children and even infants were often dosed with opiates for toothaches. During the era, doctors who served as rudimentary pharmacists had no formalized training, and they freely advised all of their patients of all ages to take opiates. Opiates were no less addictive in Regency England than they are today, with countless contemporary reports of lives destroyed and sufferers dying from addiction and then overdose. A, a famous poet, Samuel Taylor, was famously addicted to opium. While he initially began taking opiates for a child at fever, it quickly progressed into an addiction that led to his wife leaving him and ended up killing him. Middle-class children were sent away from the family. 18th century and 19th century European parents had quite, um, uncharitable views of children. <laughs> Some philosophers and religious teachers preached that children were too young to speak rationally and were virtually worthless and just lumps of flesh. Others taught an even harsher belief, somehow, that young children were the original vessels of sin who needed to be cleansed. Adherence to either of these views tended to outsource any of the parenting of their young children, as it was below the status and efforts of middle and upper class parents to care for such lowly beings directly. Wealthier families tended to use nurses or family acquaintances of lower social status to raise their children through their youngest period. More impoverished families simply locked young children in an attic or a spare room and treated them with only the most basic care that they needed to survive waiting them to become older and, and to invest more time and energy into them. 
And once the children were older and sufficiently ripe with trauma, around 8 to 10 years old, boys of middle and upper class families would often be sent away again, this time to formal boarding schools. But girls were typically educated at home, rather, by a governess or her parents. Murder scenes were tourist attractions. It's probably not surprising that in an era before the internet, television, or even radio, that entertainment was really hard to find and often a bit strange. Even reading would have been difficult past daylight hours in Regency England as quality candles were extremely expensive. Death was a powerful cultural force in the Regency period and, and this fascination combined with a relative lack of entertainment in the period led to a, it led to a particularly grim pastime murder tourism. When news of a murder broke in city, flocks of people would rush to the location hoping to see gritty evidence or anything. Sometimes a public auction would take place with tourists attempting to buy items from the murder scene, as there was no forensic evidence in the Regency era. People would basically be allowed to trample all over the murder scene, obscuring or destroying any evidence that might have been there. Murder scenes became a popular form of tourist attraction, especially if the victim was somebody popular. Candles and other household items were deadly. Aside from the ever-present threat of disease in an era before the advent of germ theory and antibiotics, countless household items from the Regency era could also kill you. Paper, cloth, and candles all contained arsenic in varying concentrations, which is, by the way, a deadly chemical also found in rat poison. Fuller situation, which was invented in 1809, was heralded as a, a miracle cure for a variety of ailments as it was marketed in small doses to women to create radiant and blemish-free skin, and for men, it was sold in increasingly large doses to provide stamina, to treat baldness, and increase virility. The, the solution contained potassium arsenate, which is a form of arsenic. The use of arsenic in everyday products was so widespread that some refer to the Regency era as the arsenic era. Dead soldiers' teeth were popular dentures. Yet the wealthy residents of Regency England had rich diets full of fat and sugar. Unfortunately for them, dental hygiene in practice was still an incredibly rudimentary science. Consequently, the richest people in the Regency era had the absolute worst and most rotted teeth, and it was very widespread among the upper crust. Uh, so dentistry was a booming industry, suffice it to say. Jewelers, blacksmiths, wig makers, and other professions all jumped into the dentistry craze, and false teeth were often crafted out of ivory bone or porcelain at an incredibly high cost. The most expensive treatment was replacing a pulled rotten tooth with a fresh tooth, and it was often from a live donor or the fresh corpse, which would, if you could imagine, spread disease. In a morbid yet fortunate turn of events for those in need of teeth, over 47,000 soldiers died in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, and after the battle was decided to be in favor of the English, people scoured the battlefield harvesting healthy teeth from the mouths of the fallen soldiers to make dentures for the wealthy back home. Unmarried couples were sewn into bed together. Bundling is an old tradition in which an unmarried couple that was courting would spend the night in a bed together with some sort of barrier between them to prevent uh, premarital relations. This practice was believed to encourage intimacy in courting young couple without allowing for any, you know, sinning to happen, and there were many forms of bundling which included placing a board down the length of the mattress to create separation or using a rolled up wad of bedding along the bed for the same purpose. Another way was to have the man lay atop the covers and the woman under, wearing a unique sack-like clothing that was very difficult to get out of <laughs> for both of them. Both lovers lying in a sack with the seam sewn out of, or, or, finally, both lovers lying in a sack with a seam sewn down the middle. Very romantic. While some religious leaders preached against bundling, it remained a widespread practice well into the 19th century. So, with all that's been said, what do you, the viewer, think about the Regency era? Which of the practices was the strangest to you? And what other historical eras would you like us to talk about? Tell me your answers in the comment section below, player. Switching it up on you, all, all gangsta-like. I am too white for that. Oh man, thank God this is at the end of the video and most people have already clicked off by now. Hey, if you enjoyed the video, like, comment, subscribe. 
And um, don't hate me. That's the only the only four things I need from you. Later. <laughs>